Nigel Farage is the leader of Brexit. The only place you'll see him is here on Sky News each and every week. Lovely to see the great man joins us now from London, the GB News host as well. How are you, great man? There's plenty to get to, including, could we talk about Cambridge University and their attitudes towards white students now? Yes, I mean, some forms of racism are now not just uh, acceptable, I think they're even fashionable. You see, if it's a form of racism that discriminates against white students applying for courses and is only open to BAME, black, Asian, minority, ethnic uh, students, that's fine. So you say to white people, and especially if they're white working class, because they really are scum, you see, in modern Britain, and you exclude them completely on the grounds of race and no one bats an eyelid, and that's all considered to be just fine. And if that's a recipe, if that's a recipe for a happy, contented country where everyone gets on together in an integrated fashion, well, I'm sorry, I think we're actually stoking up even bigger racial division than has ever existed before. And yet, the extraordinary thing is, all of this happens virtually without comment. Well, and it's a bit like when, when you were here, and remember we were talking about the New South Wales Police sending you a bill for security because somebody was going to come and try and cause trouble at a speech you were at. Again, we're the frog in the pot here, and I know sort of, you know, we're basically every single day, nobody wakes up thinking this is the thing that they're going to have to fight about, but it's just how multifaceted the fight is, how the left is in everything, and... Uh, you know, certainly Andrew Claven is a great uh, YouTuber, part of the Daily Wire network. He says, stop thinking we're yeah. defending a culture. We've lost it. We're now on the outside and have to fight our way back in. Well, I think he raises a very fair point, because if you actually look at the institutions, you know, um, and this applies as much in Australia as it does here in the UK, you look at the educational establishment, you look at many branches of government, you look at the infiltration into police forces and elsewhere, you know, you can see uh, that in cultural terms, you know, the, 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 sort, the sort of extreme liberals, the intolerant extreme liberals are pretty much in control of everything. And by the way, that includes media too. Too, with, of course, the exception of Sky News in Australia. <laughs> but, 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 you know, we've got a real problem here. Yeah, yeah. And, and so much of this, so much of this is because of a lack of leadership. It's because of conservative cowardice. It's because political leaders don't like nasty things being said about them on Twitter and haven't got the backbone and the resolve to stand firm. So, yeah, we have lost a great deal of ground and we have to take it back. And yet, as I said to you last week, you know, when you see what happened to Nicola Sturgeon and her trans ideology in Scotland, you realise that that pendulum can go back. And when it starts to move back, it gets overwhelming public support. But we need, we need much better, stronger political leaders right across the Western world. And this is where, in America, the Republicans have both Trump and DeSantis who are prepared to stand up and say these things. And if you look in my country or yours, at those currently holding senior positions in elected politics, you've got to ask the question, where are they? Yeah, bloody oath. And also, part of this responsibility here too is on the voter, right? Is that you have to be willing to break uh, maybe patent, voting patterns of a lifetime, and even if you're not willing to do it in the voting booth, do it when a pollster calls you, so at least there can be some registering. It's that sort of data that changes internal politics, rather than, again, the silent majority being cranky. You've got to tell the existing establishment, I'm not, I'm not going to play with you anymore. You can't take me for granted. You can't bank my vote. Yes, the problem here, of course, is that people give up. They say, you know what, the hell with it, it's all over, it's done, it's gone, we're beaten. And so they don't respond to pollsters, they don't, and, and I know you have compulsory voting, but we don't, that very often they don't turn out yeah. to vote in elections. And that's why we got Brexit. We got Brexit because a couple of million people who do not normally vote, or in some cases had never voted in their lives, thought for once they might be able to make a difference. So it is about... It is about inspiring people into saying to them, look, don't give up. We can turn the tide on this stuff, but we can't do it without you.
Now, Richard, uh, Richard, what am I talking about here? Rishi Sunak looks like he's got some sort of an extra deal when it comes to Brexit, an extra particular one when it comes to the uh, borders in and around Northern Ireland. Here's part of his announcement, yeah. but apparently King Charles might have been involved in some of these negotiations. I can't wait for your say on that. But here's the British Prime Minister. Roll the tape. I believe the Windsor framework marks a turning point for the people of Northern Ireland. It fixes the practical problems they face... It preserves the balance of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. <laughs> He's such a private schoolboy getting to play to be Prime Minister. But anyway, <laughs> uh, feel free to speak like a normal person. Uh, but what about oh. King Charles? Do you reckon he was in this? F Firstly, this is huge. This is the biggest political victory in history. Do you realise, as a result of this, we can now transport sausages... <laughs> from England to Northern Ireland. We can have the same sausages on cocktail sticks at parties in Belfast or London. I mean, this is enormous. Can you imagine the scale of this victory? Well, all that Rishi, I mean, all that Rishi Sunak has done is to pare back some of the shocking rules that Boris Johnson so dishonestly signed us up to back in 2019. But the part that makes my blood boil is calling it the Windsor Framework, using the name of that historic town as if in some way to convey to the world this is a really, really big deal, and then to involve the king. To get the king to meet a woman called Ursula von der Leyen, a failed German politician who is now at the head of the bureaucracy in Brussels. She hasn't been elected. She can't be removed. She's not even a head of state. And before, before the so-called deal is even ratified by Parliament, the king effectively is giving it his blessing. Now, we are told the king acts on advice from ministers, especially from the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. But because the King is advised to do something doesn't mean that he has to. And here's where the great danger lies. Twice in my time in the European Parliament, Charles came and addressed that assembly. Once I remember causing a bit of a furore because I wouldn't give him a standing ovation and I sat there with my arms crossed <laughs> because he basically said, I love the European Union, I want it to have more power. Now, I did think at the time that if we went back a few centuries, uh, princes that spoke in that manner might have finished up in the Tower of London. But mm. never mind, we are where we are. He promised us, as king, he would not get involved in politics. Had this change already gone through Parliament, then it might have been fair enough to meet von der Leyen. But as it was being presented with the use of the name Windsor, with his role as king, I think in constitutional terms, he's made a very big mistake. And I worry that if he goes on behaving like this, he will alienate the section of the population who are most inclined to believe in monarchy, namely the unionists in Northern Ireland and many of us over here on the mainland too. It is a deeply... Fr from Sunak, I'm not surprised. Mm. This is classic Goldman Sachs cynical manoeuvring. But the king, I think, has made a mistake. The Paris Peace Accord or the Windsor Sausage Party? Which one will make great history forever? Thank you, Nigel. We'll talk to you again soon.